please turn with me to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John chapter 19. John chapter 19, and my message this morning is Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, John chapter 19, and we're dealing with this series, The Shadow of the Cross. We're dealing with individuals and groups of people who actually were so near the cross that they fell under the shadow of it, or its shadow fell on them physically, but more than that, they stood around the cross, they saw Christ being crucified, and they were either going to have to respond to the message of the cross as an enemy or a friend. Everyone standing around the cross who knew that Jesus was being died, or who were involved with it, or who saw it with their eyes, they either proved themselves to be against Jesus, Jesus are to be for Jesus, mm. to be his friend or to be his enemy. There is no third option, either you're for him or you're against him. Amen. Either you're living for him or you're living for yourself, but there is no other middle spot. And it's always the cross that reveals where you are. Saints, never hide from the work of the cross. You can easily hide from it and say, I'm fine. Yeah. Do not do that. Let the cross penetrate your heart because I assure you if the cross exposes sin God only exposes sin by the cross to deal with it. Yeah, if you yeah. try to defend yourself, the cross will destroy you. Yeah, yeah. But if you open yourself up and let, let's say let it find sin in me, let it reveal my heart, then it will also be the power of salvation. My message Mary Magdalene reading from John Chapter 19, I just want to read one simple verse here. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Let's pray together. Father, I pray, Jeez. Lord God, that you bless your word, that you open it. We believe that you speak a word in season, that you gather yes. to hear your word. You're not a God who plays with feelings yes. or emotions. You love us. You died for us. You care about us. Yes. And so you deal with our hearts. You deal with our lives. And then you call us to a real relationship with yourself. My God, I ask of you, in the mighty name of Jesus, reveal, Lord God, the power of your cross. Reveal the message of the cross. Reveal this crucified Savior who died for us at Calvary in Jesus' oh, mighty name. Amen. 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 John chapter 19 and verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus three women. Note it, count it, and note their name. His mother, her name was Mary. Second of all, his mother's sister, or his auntie. Her name was also Mary, the wife of Cleopas. And then there was a third lady called Mary Magdalene. In this simple verse we read of three ladies standing shoulder to shoulder by the cross. All three of them were called Mary, but one of them was Mary, his mother, one was Mary, his auntie, and one was called Mary Magdalene. In the other Gospels, because they talk about the same event, in Mark 15, 40, it says, There were also women looking on afar at the cross among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, the less of Joseph, and of Salome, and, and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women, which came up with him unto Jerusalem. Now what's it saying here? There were many women. Some of them are named, many of them are not. There were many women. There was a great gathering of women who came out of Galilee. It was the highest region of Israel where Jesus ministered, where he gathered his little army. And this great group of women, they came from Galilee and they came with Jesus when he came down to Jerusalem and they came into Jerusalem with him. A great army of these women. 
And here as we see Jesus crucified on the cross, it says many of these women who had followed him, who had been saved by him, healed, changed, delivered, and who had followed with him and ministered with him and ministered unto him during a year and a half period. These women were standing around the cross at a distance. They weren't very close. They were at a distance. They stood afar off. And as the soldiers nailed him and erected him there and hung him on the cross, and as all the religious began to mock him, and as the two thieves reviled him, and as all these people say, if you're the Son of God, why don't you bring yourself down? All this band of women stood at a distance, and they are looking on. Do you realize who these women are? Their lives individually have been changed. Only one person loved them enough to change them. Some of them were vile sinners. Some of them were hopelessly sick. Some of them were demented by demons. And yet all of them stood there shoulder to shoulder. Their birth was different. Their lives were different. Their families were different. Their towns were different. But they had one experience in common. This man, Jesus Christ, saved them and changed their life. Amen. And all these women are gathered there at the cross. I want you to notice Peter wasn't there. Mm. Matthew wasn't there. Yeah. James wasn't there. Mm. Many of these others, they were not there at the cross. Peter, the greatest apostle. Peter, the man who said, all these can desert you, but I won't desert. Yeah. I'll die for you. No, Peter, you try to kill from him. Then you ran. Mm -hmm. You ran. Mm -hmm. Peter's scared out of his wits. He's either in hiding now or he's crying, breaking his heart, ashamed of himself. But look at all these women. Look at all these women who are standing amidst the ridicule. In an hour when everybody has deserted Christ. In a time when everybody is laughing at him. In the hour of his greatest shame and of his greatest suffering. Look at these band of ladies standing there. I'm sure their hearts are broken. I'm sure they're crying tears. I'm sure they're groaning in their heart. As they look at the one who changed their life. The one they love. The one who set them free. The one who they are utterly devoted to. And now he hangs crucified on this tree. And everybody is mocking him. And everybody is rejecting him. But this band of women are faithfully there. Notice again in John 19, 25. It says, now they're stood by the cross. You see, this isn't just the women who stood afar off looking. Now we come closer to the cross. And we read that three women were standing by the cross, at the foot of the cross. They were there as close to the cross as you can get. And the three Marys were standing there. These three women called Mary. There's only one country outside of Israel that has been marked by the name Mary. And I can assure you, it is Ireland. Yeah. Outside of Jerusalem and Israel, no other countries has had as many women called Mary as Ireland. In Limerick, you'll get all these Marys and you've got to distinguish between them. Mm. Old Mary, young Mary, tall Mary, thin Mary. You've got to distinguish them. And that's what happens here in John 19, 25. The three Marys are distinguished. One is his mother, one is his auntie, and one is called Mary Magdalene. I want you to notice here it says, they stood by the cross. Don't miss any little words yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Be very careful when you read the Bible. Little words are important words. It says that Mary Magdalene stood by the cross of Jesus. What does it mean to stand? The word stand means to continue. It means to be established, unmovable. It means to be steadfast and to say, all hell is not going to move me. It means to stick your feet down, to balance your legs, to take up your posture, yeah. that nobody can knock you off your stance. 
Now, now what you're saying, I'm standing here, I'm not moving from here, nobody's going to move me from here, nothing can draw me away. I am here to stay. I'm here for the duration. As long as he is on this cross, I am going to stand here at the foot of the cross. I want to tell you the first thing I see about Mary Magdalene is that she put herself at the foot of the cross. She's hearing all of the laughter. She is seeing all those who reject him. The mocking of the soldiers. The angry priests who devised his his ruthless murder, the crowd who are jeering him, the two men on the cross who accuse him. She is standing in the midst of this, immovable. Their mocking doesn't affect her. All the rejection of that hour doesn't make her say, well, I'll just stand at the back of the crowd. Or maybe I can go down into Jerusalem. My heart is with them, but I don't need to be seen here. This woman, Mary Magdalene, apart from his mother, and his auntie was the third woman standing there immovable the rejection doesn't affect her the shame doesn't affect her the suffering doesn't affect her the threat of her life doesn't affect her she says I love this man all hell cannot get me away from him I would rather stand here than die than be separated from him in his last dying moments. There are those who stand at the cross who cannot be moved. Peter wasn't such a man. He was really born again. He was an apostle of Christ. He was a revivalist preacher. But I assure you he went into hiding when he failed Christ. Can you be saved and failed? Yes. But you can't live in that state. I tell you your heart will break and you'll run back to him and you'll say what must I do to be right with you? But Peter wasn't a rebel against God. He failed Jesus Christ. But look at this Mary Magdalene. We don't read about her denying him or forsaking him or hiding or being scared or being affected by the crowd. Do you know many Christians are affected by the crowd? Everyone starts saying this and they go in that direction. Then everyone moves over here and they move in that direction. Everyone says this and they say that. Everybody goes to hear this popular preacher and they go there. Mary Magdalene was not like that. She put herself at the foot of the cross. She anchored herself and she says I am continuing here. I'll follow him to his death. I'll follow him to his tomb. I'll go where he goes. If it means popularity, praise God, I'll be there. If it means rejection and death, I will be there. But one sure thing is no devil, no world, no crowd is going to get between me and my Savior. You see, Mary Magdalene is one of the most misrepresented women in the New Testament of any woman in the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church says she was a harlot and prostitute, but the Bible doesn't say that. Amen. Mary Magdalene was not an immoral woman. She was not a loose woman. The church said that. The Bible never yeah. said that. It isn't too many years ago that the Gospel of Philip was found in some desert in the back of beyond and some man found it made a lot of money out of it somebody transcribed it and they said look we found in here that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and look here it says that Jesus kissed Mary on the lips and you had all these books written and all these movies made and all of the newspapers were saying here is the lost gospel revealing that Mary was the wife of Jesus. What a lot of rubbish. Since I watched a documentary of the man who found the document and who translated it and he held it up in his hands and it's a little broken fragment. It, all it is is one document. It's very broken. And you know what he said? Right in the middle of the document was a big black empty space, a bit missing. And it says, Jesus kissed, big blank space. And he says, no, we believe, now I'm telling you, you Google this, and you get all these people saying, it authoritatively says that Jesus kissed her. No, it didn't, is the guy who found it. And he pointed at it and he says, look, Jesus kissed blank. And he says, we know that it, probably says this. Since 
She is the most misrepresented lady that ever lived. Yeah. She's lied about by the church and the atheists. They have blackened her name, saying she was a harlot, the husband of Christ, and a thousand other things. But let us this morning look at who Mary Magdalene is, was, and will be when we meet her. Very shortly, yeah, I am going to meet yeah. Mary Magdalene. I'm going to say, can I shake the hand of one of those three Marys who stood at the foot of the cross and said, I will not be moved. Here I stand, and nothing is going to move me. I don't care what man says. I don't care the threat. Saints, do you have such a stand in your Christian life? Do you make such a stand at the cross? Because I assure you, if you don't make that at the cross, you you will be moved. People try to stand for Christ, but it's not at the cross. It's not because of the cross. It's not for a crucified Christ. And they fail. When we begin to read the Gospels about Mary, her name is always Mary Magdalene. To distinguish her from other Marys. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all of these other Marys. <laughs> She was from a little town, a little village, fishing village called Magdala, or Magdala, that was on the Sea of Galilee. It was a little fishing village, coastal village, on that beautiful lake. Saints, if you bring up pictures of that little village, it is beautiful. It is scenic. It is a place of relaxing. It is a place where the boats came in with their great catch of fish. And this little lady, Mary, was called Mary Magdalene because she was Mary from Magdala. Mm. That's where she got her name from. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 3, we read that she was a woman of great substance. And what that means is she had property or she had a lot of money. She was a woman with a bit of money. She was a younger lady who did have an experience with Christ. But in her early days, she lived in Magdala, in this beautiful place, but it was a sinful place. It was a place with religion, but it was also a place of great immorality, of great confusion, and of a mixture of ideas. It wasn't as Jewish as Jerusalem was, but it had enough religion to keep the people satisfied. But look at her name, Mary. The name Mary is the same as Mary in the Old Testament and in the Greek it means Mara or in the Hebrew it means Mara meaning to be bitter to have trouble or to have sorrow now this little lady with all of her money born in a beautiful place identified with a calm relaxing seaside resort this woman this little lady in her younger days she was marked with sorrow she was sorrowful in name and sorrowful in life. She actually had a great bitterness in her life. She had a terrible trouble that you can imagine. If you'd met her as a Christian, you could never imagine it. But she had a terrible tragedy in her life. You know, I've met a lot of people and they say, Oh, you don't know what happened to me. Look what happened to this one. And I got hurt in this way. And this person done to me. And I went through a broken marriage. Or this person betrayed me. And these people hurt me. Welcome to the real world. Yeah. Anyone not gone through it? Yeah. I can tell you stories that would make your hair stand on end if you had hair. I can assure you, I can tell you many stories, but I'm not a victim of that. Right. I am not bitter here today. I am not angry. I am not jealous. I'm not seeking revenge. I am free in my heart. Right. And God. since we God. want to see what is the bitterness Amen. of this little lady, she had a Mara. She had a bitter past. She had a troublesome past. She had a past filled with tragic sorrow. And when you truly see her past, when you see her stand at the cross, it is a miracle. Amen. It isn't natural. She shouldn't have been there. She should have been a bitter, angry, jealous woman. She should have been a mess. But she wasn't. She had the courage of Christian conviction. She had a remarkable strength. She didn't fear man. She didn't fear trouble or opposition. She was unmovable. Who, what is this sorrow that was in her life? It says in Luke chapter 8 verse 2, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. 
I want to tell you her sorrow, her past. She had seven demons living in her. She didn't have the devil living in her. She had seven demons. What are demons? They are fallen angels. They are dark angels. They are angels or demons of great darkness and wickedness. These seven demons lived in her. And in Luke chapter 8 it says, This Mary Magdalene, when you know her, you're going to hear her testimony that she had seven demons go out of her. I mean real demonic spirits. They were cast out of her. And the reason you can explain that she is such a strong woman is her deliverance from these seven demons. She had a tragic life. She had a sorrowful life. She had a tormented life. She was a prisoner of these seven, seven demons. A little later we read in Mark chapter 16 verse 9. Concerning her out of whom Christ cast the seven devils. Who done it? Jesus Amen. delivered her. From a woman filled with seven demons. To a woman who was a radical disciple of Jesus Christ. How did it happen? Jesus cast those seven demons out and she became a different woman. When she first appears in the New Testament in the Gospels, when we first see her, this is the testimony that we read about her. If there's one thing you're going to read about her, some of you it may, may be such and such who was saved out of crime. Such and such who was saved out of Catholicism. Yeah, yeah. Or they were saved out of drunkenness. Or from drugs. Or from immorality. Or from some other thing. I tell you all of us in this room. As I look at you. I think of particular things about your life. That marks your testimony. Yeah, yeah. Well do you know with her. Everywhere she went. They said Mary. Out of whom seven demons were cast. She was changed. Do you know everywhere she went? Mary, give us a testimony. I will. I'll Amen. give you the day. I'll give you the day. I'll give you the man who done it. He cast seven demons out of me. I've never been the same again. I've never gone back there. I've never returned to the pig's well. I am a free woman. They were in me. How did it happen? Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Is it any wonder she stood at that cross? Are you a woman that was so set free? She goes, I ain't moving from the cross. I don't care if they nail me to a fourth cross. I am standing here. I was saved by you. Yeah, you right. changed me. I can never forget that day when out of me came those seven dark demonic spirits. And <laughs> for the first time in my life, I was free. I mean, I was free. She I must know, have wept. Yeah. Maybe she'd done a little dance. Maybe she shouted. I tell you, she was sorrowful. She was broken in spirit. But that day she went free. Absolutely free. No wonder she stood at the cross. And amidst the ridicule, amidst the mockery, here stands a young lady with utter love, utter devotion. Everyone else is mocking him. Everyone else is scorning him. She didn't say any words at the cross. She didn't rebuke anyone. All she's doing is looking at her master. You know, Jesus must have looked down upon her. From the cross, he's hearing the ridicule. He's hearing them laughing. He's seeing them threw lots for his garments and he looks down on her face and he says I'd do it all again mm -hmm. for that little lady Amen. I would Amen. gladly go to the cross shed my blood Amen. and suffer Amen. all of this people Jesus. may laugh at me but not her Amen. she's standing weeping she's standing broken he remembers the day he cast demons out of her mm -hmm. he remembers the condition when he first met her oh, what yeah. she was doing how she was how her mind was he remembers that day when he cast the demons out of her one after another until all seven were gone and she stood there free weeping rejoicing believing on him as her messiah it says in luke chapter 8 and verse 2 which had been healed of evil spirits 
and infirmities. Do you realize this last generation, the Bible warns us that the mark of this generation is going to be a flood tide of doctrines of demons and seducing spirits. Do you realize we stand on the edge of one of the most demonic hours in all of world history? No other generation is going to be like this. The Bible says just at the end, before Jesus comes back, that the devil comes down, the pit of hell opens up, and spirits come up out of the pit, because this is their last hour. Since we are on the verge of the most demonic hour that Ireland has ever seen, that Limerick has ever seen, and that the church has ever seen, we better know what the demonic power is, we better know that we're going to face an onslaught of the enemy, and we better know how to stand at the cross. No demon of hell could touch that lady as she stood at the cross looking at her saviour the world's against her the world's against her saviour but I tell you no demon of hell can touch her no demon of hell has an inroads in her life she is free from hell you see that day on Golgotha's hill we're told in the bible that was his hour of darkness that was his hour of suffering that's when all men turned against him and ridiculed him but there is a little lady standing there in the darkness amidst the rejection amidst all of the unbelief she believes she's got faith in her heart she's got love in her heart she's got utter devotion she doesn't understand everything she must have been confused what do I do now that Jesus is being crucified what am I to do after this day how do I go through tomorrow she didn't know but this one thing she knew I love him I believe in him I will follow him even on to the death. Saints, we are on the verge of the most demonic hour and we better be ready for it. What does it mean for a woman to have an evil spirit or to be demon possessed? And the Bible does talk about it. The term demon possessed or in the Greek demonized, you could say someone who's demonized. Or someone who has a demon. What does that mean? It means there's literally a demon living within them. Not all sinners have demons. Not even all vile sinners have demons in them, okay? You've got Christians running about, I'm scared of demons in me. Hey, all sinners on the street out there now do not have demons in them. Yeah, yeah. All drunkards do not have demons in them. Yeah. All fornicators do not have demons in them. Okay, you need to get that settled. But to be demon possessed means you at least have one demon living in you. The, these terms that we have mentioned are never used in connection with oppression or depression. Listen to me carefully. Or temptation. Or other attacks outwardly or in your mind. That isn't demon possession. That does not mean you have a demon in you. Your mind could be pulled apart by temptation and wicked thoughts. That does not mean you have a demon in you. And you must settle that. The devil can harass you and you're not demon possessed. He can tempt you and you're not demon possessed. He can overwhelm you and even cause you to sin but you're not demon possessed. You must get that very clear in your mind or you're going to get confused. Remember Christ was tempted. Right. But he certainly didn't have demons in him or in his mind. He had terrible temptations come to him. You can be as pure as anything, but yet terrible temptations will come to you. Right. Neither do these terms refer to a born again believer. No real Christian can have a demon inside them. It is impossible, utterly impossible. When demons indwell an individual, Listen to me, I'm defining what it means. They exert an abnormal, unnatural, not natural, yeah. natural to be tempted, natural to fear, natural to get discouraged. Yeah. But when a demon comes to live in someone, it is an abnormal, unnatural control and a dominating influence. Not just an influence. It is a dominating influence. They get driven by that demon. They come under the control of that demon, either physically in their bodily or mentally within their mind. 
In the New Testament we have an example, or many examples of demons and individuals. Some of them were deaf and dumb. And they had demons within them. All deafness and dumbness is not because of a demon. Yeah. It can be natural. Right. It's a natural illness. But some of it was because of a demon. Even blindness could be because of a demon. But it is rare. Normally it's a very natural thing. We read of a young boy who kept throwing himself in the fire. He didn't want to do it. He didn't enjoy doing it. He didn't desire it. But within him was a power and an influence and a way of thinking. And he kept throwing himself in the fire. I tell you, that is a demon-possessed boy. He didn't do any vile sin. He's only a young boy. He was born like that. He grew up like that. I don't understand everything. But that boy didn't sin. And he wasn't in that condition because of sin. He was a victim of a real devil. And he couldn't get free. His mommy couldn't get him free. None of the family could get him free. He was a victim of the devil. He hated this. His mother hated it. But he was a victim of it. That is demon possession. Don't feel like when your emotions drive you towards sin that you're demon possessed. You're not. That is your flesh. Don't blame the devil. It is your old fallen nature. You need to repent. You need to deal with that flesh. Do not blame the devil on those occasions. You see, someone with a demon in them, they can't control themselves. Very often somebody would speak, but it wouldn't be them speaking. It is the devil using their voice. Now I can assure you, when that happens, there is a demon. Yeah. You're not going to have demons speak through your voice and not know about it. When your vocal cords are taken over and you don't have control, that is demon possession. And I want to tell you, there's very few demon possessed souls in our world. You see, there were no mild cases of demonization. Because you're tempted doesn't mean that you're demon-possessed. Because you go and sin doesn't mean you're demon-possessed. There are no mild cases. Someone who's demon-possessed, it is a very dark, torturous, and terrible experience. It tears your mind apart. It tears your entire life apart. From morning to night, you're in utter constant pain agony and torment that's a work of the devil you see the devil only resides within an individual with one purpose and with one goal to destroy them to ruin them and to torment them day and night. This is the devil. I'm telling you about a real devil. Yeah. And if there wasn't a cross. And there wasn't a Jesus. And there wasn't blood. You would be at the mercy of this devil. Yeah. The devil wants to kill every one of you. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to confuse your mind. He wants to torment you day and night. That is a real devil. But I do have a real Jesus. And I know the power of the cross. And I know what the word of God says. And I know my heart is saved. And I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. Greater is he that is in me. Than he that is in the world. Who is in me? Jesus is in me. If Christ be in you. Then you have everything. You see it was a mental and physical torment. Rather than any particular dominant sin. Some few foolish ministry Christians, they've seen the word unclean spirit in the Bible and they think that's an immoral spirit. It's not. There was a man who was deaf and dumb and he had an unclean spirit cast out of him. That unclean spirit didn't mean he was immoral. It meant he was deaf and dumb. And when that unclean spirit left him, he could speak. He could hear. He was healed by the power of God. So don't confuse terms in the Bible. Each time that a demon or demons left an individual or persons, they immediately went through a dramatic change physically, mentally and spiritually. Immediately. It didn't take place over years. It didn't take months to cast demons out. It didn't take years of rehab, of going to Christian yeah. counseling, of going through inner healing, of having lots of ministry sessions yeah. that exhaust you, of someone hoking about in you, in your soul realm, trying to find if there's a demon in there. All that is trash ministry. Yeah. 
yeah. since I'm against Christian counseling, inner healing, yeah. it's guru. That's yeah. all they are. They're Christian mm. gurus. Mm. They're playing games with your internals. <laughs> when Christ set me free, I was free, oh, saints yeah. of God. Amen. The Bible doesn't say go back to your mother's womb and those early memories and that'll give you the secret to set you free. It won't. That's right. It won't. It'll confuse you. You'll go into a labyrinth that you'll never get out That's of right. unless God in His grace will help you. You see, saints, this is the terrible affliction of demonology. But when Jesus casts a demon out, or when a Christian casts a demon out, and if you have had a demon, you'll be immediately, dramatically set free. I tell you, you can't have the devil go out of you. Do you know sometimes in the Bible, when the demon left, it rent the person. Yeah. It rent the person. Didn't go easily. I tell you, they kicked up a stir. I don't want to leave here. You're leaving. You're leaving. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is Jesus coming. No devil can resist it. Jesus. Yeah. No power of hell can stand against it. <laughs> Jesus be in me. I've got a power in me greater than all hell. Yeah. I and myself am not greater than the devil or any little demon. I can't stand against the demon. But if Christ be in me, I do have one who's yeah. greater than all of that. Amen. These seven yeah. demons cast out of Mary Magdalene were literally <laughs> dwelling within her. Listen to what I just told you about demonology. The torment, the torture, the pain, how drastic it was to control the life. This is Mary Magdalene. Her mind, her body was dominated and controlled by the devil. Seven demons were in her. They wanted to destroy her. Do you know the devil's got a plan for your life here this morning? He wants to destroy you. But I also want to tell you, Jesus has a plan for your life. To redeem, to save, to recover. And to have you standing at the cross. Saints, it is real. This little lady had seven demons within her tormenting her. Who can imagine the affliction or torment of her mind, of her heart, of her life? All who knew her in Magdala, listen to me, in this little village, everybody knew her. When she come down the street, if she came down the street, they said, she has demons in her. She's possessed. We've tried everything. She's got a lot of money. She's went to every doctor. Every guru, every witch doctor, every religious priest, he, she's tried everything. She would spend any amount of money to be free. But you know what? She's got a nice house. She's got all this money. She's got everything. But she doesn't have peace of heart. She can't enjoy it. Do you know what? If you're not right with God, you can't enjoy anything. I've seen men that have got good jobs. They've got big cars, big houses. They've got a beautiful wife. They've got lovely little children. They can't even enjoy it. You know why? Because they're not right with God. They can't enjoy any of it whatsoever. This little lady was afflicted with seven demons. All who knew her knew she was afflicted by the devil. There was no doubt. Everybody in that community knew her. Everybody in the surrounding towns. Anywhere she went, they went, that's Mary of Magdala or Mary Magdalene. That's her. That's the one we've talked about. We've told you about. You keep your kids away from her. I tell you, her life is a mess. I wish I could help her, but nobody can help her. She is beyond the help. She's been to the synagogue. The Jewish priests have come up. The rabbi has been up here. Everybody's laid hands on her. She's just the same. Nobody could help her. They even tried to get her to Jerusalem. Tried to get her in Solomon's temple. Well, the demons wouldn't let her go. There is no hope for that lady. She's a new hoper. Maybe she had committed some vile sin when she was young. Maybe she deserves it. Maybe she doesn't want God. Maybe she doesn't want free. This was Mary Magdalene. All who knew her knew she was afflicted. Among those who were in Magdala, none were afflicted like her. In the whole region, if there was one lady in all of Israel who was demon-possessed, it was this lady. No other lady in the New Testament was more demonized, more demon-possessed, more bound of the devil, or more filled with the devil than this lady. Since it's not some... Satan worshipper on the street corner who's filled with the devil. You can have some per person afflicted by the devil. They're a victim of the devil. They're not a vile person. But they need someone to help them. 
First look at her salvation. First she was delivered, then she was saved. First Christ cast out the demon, then she was born again or changed in her heart. Christ had to bind and cast out the strong men in her life before he could come into her heart. But she had to get out of relationship with those demons before she could come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus teaching in Matthew 12, listen, he's, he, Christ explains, you cannot enter into a strong man's house, talk about a demon possessed person, you cannot enter into a strong man's house unless he first, unless you first bind him. What's he talking about? The house is a person, a victim of the devil. Who is the strong man? He is the demon. The strong man is in the house. The devil is in the person. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I cannot enter into that person. I cannot enter into that house until I first bind the devil and cast him out. If I don't cast him out, I can't enter in. Right. That means that no Christian can be demon possessed. Mm. Jesus doesn't come into a life until yeah. the demon is cast out. Yeah. Jesus says, first I must bind the strong man, I must cast him out, then I can come into his life. Right. Here, this is very important. The term strong man means mighty one, or one who has great power, or a forcible one who forces himself on an individual. So this strong man is one who comes into an individual with power. He has power. He is dominating that life. Jesus says, until I cast him out, I can come in to that life. But I do want to come into that life. And I will cast the devil out first. He says, first, underline that, first find the strong man. First, first what? First before you come in. First before you can get born again. First before Jesus can come into your life. That, that strong man needs bound. And what the word bind means is to tie him up and cast him out. It doesn't mean to pray in prayer meetings. Never fill these prayer meetings with. I bind you Satan. I bind this power. I bind that power. That isn't prayer. Yeah, and that isn't what this is talking about. If a person has a demon in them. You bind it by casting it out and the person's free. You don't bind a demon by saying, I bind you, Satan. It's not in the Bible. Amen. When Jesus binds a demon, he sets someone free. He cast, He goes, you're a woman. You're a man. You've got a demon. I'm going to cast the demon out. If he casts it out, that woman's different. Amen. I've seen a lot of charismatic teaching. I bind you. I bind you. I bind this. I bind that. Someone once in a charismatic house meeting, they got me to stand up, measured my arms. They said, oh boy, looked at me. One of them was a leader. One of them was a prophetess. Looked at me, looked at each other. I went, boy, this is bad. The diagnosis is bad. I said, what is it? I said, you've got one arm shorter than the other. I always forget which it is. I said, you've got one arm shorter than the other. It means your spine is twisted. Never knew that. You do now. What does that mean? It means you have a twisted demonic spirit in you. <laughs> Saints, I believed this at the time. I went, man, I'm a young Christian. I go, they're prophets. They hear from God. They're leaders. And they're discerning by the length of my arm. I've got a demon. I went, oh no. But I'm glad they're here. Do you know what they've done? They went next door and had a cup of tea. I went, God help me. They're going to leave me with this demon. Never cast it out of me. Still to this day, one of those arms is short of that. We, we'll get to the root of it. Saints, I'm telling you, that's the foolishness that's that has right. come into the church yeah, in our generation. Yeah. If an individual has a demon, we cast it that's out. Right. We bind the strong man. There is power. I'm not going to argue with the demon. I'm not holding a conversation. You will go in Jesus' name. And no demon of hell can stand against that. Jesus can only spoil the goods of the demon or seize his property if he binds them and casts them out. Yeah. If he casts them out, he then can have the property. Do you know what happened with Mary Magdalene? She have had to have the strong man cast out before Jesus comes in her life. These seven demons have to get out 
before she comes into a relationship with Jesus. Mary Magdalene had a strong man and they were seven demonic powers. Christ cast them out. He then came in to possess her property since she was radically different after this. It, it is real what Jesus does in changing the life. Listen what she was like after this. Listen to her testimony before we close. Her deliverance was well known in the early church. Everybody knew about it. Yeah. Everybody in Magdala knew she is different. Can you imagine having seen her? That demented woman, she's scratching her face. She's pulling her hair. She's never washed. She's always crying, always frothing at the mouth. She's demented. Her life is destroyed. Then one day, you're standing on Magdala on that little central road. You're with your mates and you go, who is that? Who's this beautiful lady? I don't mean beauty in a carnal sense. I mean there's a beauty about her. Who is this woman? It can't be. It is. That's the lady we've known all of our days. You know what? She was coming singing. Maybe she was whistling. Maybe she was doing a wee dance. But she's got the joy of the Lord. She's rejoicing. Mary, what happened to you? Mary, you're not the same woman. Mary, is that you? It is me. What happened? I met a man called Jesus. I met a man. What was it? Christian rehab? Did I have to lock you up for three years and pop out you come like a newborn baby and I'm free? No. One meeting with Jesus. He cast the demons out. I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have got myself free. I couldn't have helped myself. But one thing I know, one thing I know, that man changed my life. Yeah. I am a free woman. All across the early church, everybody knew Mary Magdalene. They knew she had been the most demon-possessed woman in the land. And yet, here she is free. It was an instantaneous miracle. Her testimony was always the same. Always seven <laughs> demons. It wasn't a year later, oh, there's another eighth one found, or another ninth, or a fifth columnist, I found another one. And I went through ten years of Christian deliverance ministry. No, it happened before she got saved, and she was a free woman. She was free from the power of the devil. And everybody knew it. Every time she told her testimony, it was always those seven demons, and he set me free. And I can never be the same again. Mary Magdalene is mentioned 14 times in the gospel. Eight of those times she is mentioned first when a group of ladies are mentioned. She's always the first, always the leader, always an example, always a testimony amongst them. These ladies, these ladies she traveled with, Susanna and many others, a group of them, after they were saved, they followed Jesus ministering unto him. And the Bible says they used their substance or their money and their possessions to minister unto the apostles. As Jesus would go minister to the 5,000 or minister in this town or in this village, here they are as a group of women. They traveled as a team. And these women whose lives were changed, they ministered, they made the food. They looked after the men. They ministered unto Christ. They paid for the accommodation. And all that possession that she had there in Magdala, she sold and she poured it into the spread of the gospel. Her one life's ambition was to finance the evangelization of her nation, of her culture, and of the spread of, her of the gospel. This one thing she lived for for the rest of of her days she lived for jesus christ she had money but money never changed her christ changed her Amen. radically now she wants to support those doing and reaching out to those who were bound like her five times she is mentioned in the bible alone nobody else is with her and the context of that is the burial of christ and the resurrection of Christ, no one else mentioned with her. But saints, let me finish this message. Let's, let me take you back past her terrible past, her torment. Past the testimony of her deliverance. Past her ministry. She had a ministry, you know. 
Do you know this lady had a full-time Christian ministry? Can ladies do that? Yes. Can they do it in the church? Yes. There is a place. <clears throat> That's for God to sort out, I assure you. <laughs> but let me take you all past that. Past the thousands, the miracles, the healings, the great meetings, the crowds who wanted to make Christ king. Let me take you back. Looking at the one she loved as he died and suffered. And she's standing there immovable saying, I know what you've done in my life. I know you set me free. I know you broke the shackles. I know you changed my entire life. Nothing is going to move me. I love this man. I believe in this man. I follow this man. Her relationship with Christ drew her to cross. Drew her to Calvary's hill. That real love and devotion led her up that hill to stand before that cross of suffering, pain and shame. If you really love Jesus, you also will journey to the cross. Mm. Time after time after time, you're going to find that the love in your heart draws you away from the crowds, away from the meetings, away from the conventions. And you're going to make a lonely journey to the cross where he was crucified. She first followed him when he was preaching, teaching, working miracles, healing the sick, casting out the demons and feeding 5,000 people. But now, on this particular day, she follows him and stands with him and stands for him in the midst of suffering, rejection, mocking, anger and even potential death. She followed him when he was popular. Now she fo follows him when he's unpopular. She was happy to serve him in the midst of vast multitudes when everything seemed good and she was happy and filled with joy and shouting in the meetings. But she's also happy to follow him when she has to stand at the bottom of a cross. Her heart is broken. There's no smile on her face and tears come down. She may not have the peace of God in her heart at this moment but she does have peace with God at that moment she's not feeling happy at that moment but there's a joy in her heart that all hell cannot steal Mary Magdalene a friend of Jesus frowned at the cross one of the last standing at the cross and one of the first at that tomb on the Sunday morning following, she was the first there, the first to see him, and the first to run to the apostles in Jerusalem and to say he's alive. She was sent on a mission, go tell them that I have risen from the dead. What a lady, saints, what a lady. What a lady, this Mary Magdalene. But what an instrument afflicted by the devil. If she hadn't had a meeting with Jesus, what a terrible end. But saints, what a beautiful life when Jesus comes into your life. Amen. When he sets you free, Amen. forgives your sin, turns you around. Amen. Free Amen. this morning. Amen. You're free this morning. Let's praise him. Just lift your hands. Let's worship him in this place.